Perfect. So this is where I practice. Uh, Pro Ortho, which is a, a clinic from Pro Alliance, which is a large multi, uh, multi-specialty group throughout Western Washington. Uh, Dr. Neil Schoner is a, is a Pro, uh, Pro Alliance brethren of mine who practices in Puyallup. Um, have the advantage of having about 15 orthopedic docs, including two spine surgeons in my practice, which is really great on the collaborative front. We talk about um, the fact that, you know, we, we need to talk. We know man is an island. And if I, uh, I just recently read the poem by John Don, 16th century English poet, no man is an island. And that couldn't be more true than in medicine, that really you need to collaborate. Like Dr. Norris said, it just makes it much better for your patient and makes it more satisfying for your practice. So, uh, so stem cells, been in the news forever. Time Magazine, going back to, I don't know when this was, but probably 20 years ago. This is, uh, again, another Time Magazine coverage. Been about four of them, I think, on Time Magazine talking about stem cells. Uh, recent one, Wall Street Journal. Hip or knee replacement without surgery, it's on the horizon. So all this exciting stuff in the lay press that's coming at us. I had a friend text me the other day about a doctor in, in Hollywood who's treating Hollywood stars and saying they're all gonna live to 150 years at least. So, um, so there's a lot of noise out there about the stem cell thing. Uh, so let's get back to the historical constant uh, context. Alexander Maximoff coined the term stem cell back in way back in 1908. We've had a number of things uh, that kind of alluded to or capitalized on that whole concept of pro, including pro prolotherapy, orthobiologics. Arnold Kaplan coined the term stem cells back in uh, mesenchymal stem cells back in 1991. William Hazeltine coined the term regenerative medicine 1999. Then Arnie Kaplan came back and said in 2017, you know, we really should have called it medicinal signaling cells, cells instead of mesenchymal stem cells for reasons that may become obvious. Uh, uh, Dr. Philippe, Philippe Ernie Gou uh, in Paris or outside of Paris has been doing stem cell injection therapy with BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, since uh, 1990 or so to the present time. Um, kind of a pioneer of sorts. With that, unfortunately, we've had a proliferation of freestanding stem cell clinics that have been, um, let's say, I would say, uh, detracting from what might be a very promising and, and, and worthwhile endeavor, uh, including stem cell clinics using the uh, so-called birth tissues. Uh, in our own area here in Washington, we had a number of uh, chiropractic clinics. I have nothing against my chiropractic colleagues. I work with a number of them. But some of these chiropractic clinics were employing um, nurse practitioners and PAs to do the actual injections of birth product, off-the-shelf uh, products that were questionable at best. Um, oh, here's uh, Arnie Kaplan coming out with his uh, article here and saying we need to change the name from uh, mesenchymal stem cells to medicinal or signaling cells, uh, and with good reason. So here's a good slide, uh, Dr. Anu Nivani down in the Bay Area, one of her slides, I just kind of stole it basically, although it's public record, I guess. Um, and direct your uh, attention to the top right there. So we have these things called pericytes throughout the body that are just sitting there waiting to be utilized. They get stimulated like an injury, releases and becomes an MSC, mesenchymal stem cell, gets activated and becomes your medicinal stem cell. Uh, the stem cell, I always tell my patients, the stem cell has, is a two-sided coin. It's the regenerative side or trophic side, but also the immune modulatory. Very important. I have patients who have done a shoulder injection and, with stem cells, and the next day they said, my pain's gone. And I said, well, that's great, but obviously that's more the immune modulatory. That's not the, the regenerative side. It takes weeks to months to start working. So just be aware of that. Um, so one of the critics, uh, or a typical critical um, point is, well, there's not enough studies uh, with stem cells. I get this all the time from, you know, a patient tells me my doctor said that stem cells don't work. Um, clearly, the, you see the uh, geometric increase in the number of studies that are doing that are being done worldwide. Um, 
it's it's a thing. It's not going away. So, um, growing number of hospitals, medical centers adopting a stem cell based, or at least a regenerative medicine uh, clinic, uh, or incorporated into their into what they provide for patients. Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General, Emory Health, Yale, Swedish Hospital here in Seattle. Uh, talk a little bit about regulatory from the FDA. Um, so the FDA basically says, traditionally the FDA says, you take anything out of the body for more than 24 hours, it becomes a pharmaceutical. Can't really follow that logic, but that's, that's kind of how, what we've been operating with. Um, and you cannot really add anything to it, because if you take out some tissue from um, my good friend Doug Beal here and add something to it, now it's a pharmaceutical, Doug. You can't, it's not yours anymore. So anyway, that's, that's kind of what we've been working under that, a little bit of a cloud with the FDA. Um, there are a number of very sad stories about people taking advantage of the whole stem cell. I hate, personally, I'm not comfortable with the word stem cell. I, I prefer the word cellular therapy, um, but the, it's out there, okay? So uh, people have taken advantage of that. There's clinics out there. Um, this one was an orthopedic clinic, I believe, in Southern California that was using some bizarre off-the-shelf umbilical product that actually ended up killing people. And it's, uh, if you're really into uh, podcasts and want to feel bad, you can look, into, look up Bad Batch. Um, recently, not that long ago, let's see, 2022, a California clinic, uh, a chain that was doing some sort of regenerative medicine, they challenged the FDA. And so this was the, basically the judge said, hey, you know what, the doctors are just doing their thing. Uh, and the FDA has nothing, they're practicing medicine including you know, medic, medicine slash surgery, and this is, shouldn't be regulated by the FDA. I'm sure this will be challenged at some point, but just that's a work in progress. Uh, there is a consensus statement that came out oh, a couple, three years ago, specifically about the amniotic, what I call the birth tissues, the amniotic fluid, umbilical cord, that sort of thing. Uh, and this panel of experts, some of whom I know, came out and said this is probably not real stem cell and shouldn't be called stem cell. Um, so, and a lot of this pertains, again, back to some of these clinics that popped up, orthopedic clinic, not orthopedic, excuse me, chiropractic clinics and other kind of fly-by-night operations that were using stem cells off the shelf that had uh, uh, dubious value at best. Uh, Laxmach County, his book here uh, from ASIP, very good reference book for all of us in this field. Um, safe and effective use of biologics, all kinds. Uh, very, um, all, the, all the authors on this are quite, oh, Doug Beal, what do you know? How about that? <laughs> what a shock. Uh, Interdiscal biologic treatments, everything from fiber and adhesives, BMP, growth differentiation factor, alpha-2 microglobulin, PRP, PRP is, actually has a very strong, uh, high-level evidence in treating interdiscal pain. When I say interdiscal, um, we all know now that interdiscal is it's probably really the bone, it's probably more accurately described as uh, vertebral discal pain, right? We know that because we know we saw these uh, motor changes for years on the MRI, and now um, we understand that's really probably that critical interface that's that's really more the, the cause of the pain. Um, so um, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, ver cellular, very viable autograph therapies. We'll touch on that in a bit. Uh, good review article by Dr. Nav uh, Navani, uh, and, uh, the, and she's also an author on a review article in this book. This is a good, really good book on, from uh, ASIP, uh, Lax uh, Machikani who is the editor-in-chief. Uh, I, think, I think they're coming out with a second edition, so you, I haven't seen that, but uh, that might be imminent. Um, anyway, again, I've, I've basically pilfered some slides from, from uh, Dr. Navani uh, in my talk here. Uh, listed all kinds of studies. I mean, there's plenty of studies. Somebody says they're not supportive studies with use of stem cells. It means they haven't really looked into it. Um, for disc BMP, oh, sorry. 
That's just PRP. That's just a few of them. BMC, bone marrow concentrate for stem cells. Uh, lots of articles. Um, another one with Dr. Navani uh, with some fairly influential collaborators on this. Uh, I think this is an ongoing study. Um, spine, this came out, I uh, forget which, I always forget what year this came out. Yeah. Um, review article, cell-based therapies for lumbodiscogenic low back pain, systematic review. Basically looked at all these articles, 390, 13, 1,393 articles, of which six were eligible for the review. Basically said, you know, pretty safe, no tumors were formed. Um, so I'm going to touch on to the more proprietary um, forms of stem cell mesoblast, which uh, is kind of a, and I, I will be free to admit that I'm not an expert in the proprietary preparations. Mesoblast, as I understand, is kind of a, a monoclonal um, stem cell um, derivative that can be used for injection. Vivex, uh, via disc, uh, more morselized um, nucleus pulposus preparation. Doug Beal is much more familiar with this stuff than I am, so if any questions, I'd, I'd ask you to direct it to, to Doug here. Um, VAST trial, I know this is a big, this is a big one where they um, show pretty good response to the via It is via disc, I believe, Doug, on this one, so. Um, and of course, we have, you know, MRI evidence of things improving and, you know, with the T2 images showing increased water content over time in a lot, in a lot of these patients uh, over time. Uh, so in my practice, I'm pretty much autologous. I use the patient's own stem cells. So here's a patient lined up. We're doing a bone marrow aspirate with a, a gem sheety type needle under fluoroscopy. Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. Nothing too fancy here. Very, you know, at least when I was in med school, they said, oh, this is a very painful bone marrow aspiration. Not painful. If you do it right <laughs> under fluoroscopy, appropriate local anesthetic, most patients go, uh, that was it. I mean, that's the most response I get. I'm so often getting the, the bone marrow aspirate right there in the tube. Pretty straightforward. My medical assistant, Justin, puts it in the, uh, we use, currently we're using the Biomat Biologic Centrifuge System which is nice um, because out of that we'll get uh, BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, as well as the PRP. I use those together and I tell patients like the, the BMAC or bone marrow is kind of like the seeds and the PRP is kind of like the fertilizer. Kind of a, kind of a rough analogy, but it kind of works. So I, I typically use those in combination. So there's the, there's the BMAC there on the right and the PRP on the left. Uh, I've traditionally have stayed away from the adipose, so two main camps, right? Bone marrow, adipose to get mesenchymal stem cells. I've stayed away primarily, I've done some adipose in the past, not really crazy about the systems that were out there. A lot of people, oh, well, one of the things is you had to add something to it. You had to add collagenase. So what does the FDA say about that? I don't know, I'm not, I don't, I want to steer clear of the FDA. So, um, recent uh, technology, we have this uh, company um, called Human Med. Uh, they got this body jacked ecosystem. This system, we're doing a mini liposuction, very simple to do. And the adipose is actually um, micronized during the process. So, I don't have to add anything to it. I'm not adding collagen. I'm, I feel like I'm well within the current guidelines of the FDA doing this. So, um, and there is evidence that um, using adipose in some populations older, I mean, all my patients are kind of on the older side, but older patients may respond better to adipose-derived uh, MSCs. So, um, I'm happy to have this. This is, you know, we're going to, we continue to modify how we do things. I'll be doing things differently, I guarantee, in two, two years from now that I'm doing today. Uh, that's just part of the process. Um, this is using the EcoJet system, so we'll get this. This is basically what we're going to use, this fraction right here, this is going to go away. Um, so there, um, anyway, there's the adipose camps, there's the bone marrow camps, and I, in some patients I've done both. 
Um, this is a patient I actually did yesterday in the clinic. So uh, severe ankle arthritis, um, mid-50s, active guy, athletic, but severe, very severe disabling ankle arthritis. So what's his options? His options are fusion and arthrodesis, uh, uh, ankle replacement, which is, they're doing more of them, but this, it's kind of a big deal, right? This guy's still very active in his 50s. And I say, well, you know, he'd had a previous uh, um, stem cells knee about six months ago doing fantastic, and now he's coming back, so I want the ankle done. And that's one of those kind of balanced conversations, what is, are we, how much can we make this better? I've had patients come in, and I look at their hip x-ray, and I say, you know what? Don't do this. Go get a hip replacement. That's a much better option for you. I, don't, I think you're going to spend time and money uh, that might not work out. And this gentleman, his options aren't great. I mean, I've, who wants a fusion when he's still a very active gentleman? Um, so we go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll see how he turns out. But uh, so getting very uh, meticulous and trying to get all three compartments involved of this ankle joint is he's, you know, and again, some of the conversation is telling patients, look, can we take you from being miserable to manageable? In some patients, that's a big win, okay? I, I, again, I mentioned this in past talks where I had a patient who was a retired nurse, um, terrible hip pain on uh, lots of narcotics, wheelchair bound, bad heart. Couldn't, no orthopedic doctor <laughs> would touch her uh, to have a hip replacement. I wasn't real excited about and stem cell on her, but you know, all things being equal, I said, well, okay, it's probably the only option she has. Uh, bottom line, we did stem cell injection on her hip. She was delighted, you know, six months later, whatever, because she was off of all of her opioids. So, that, and that's one extreme example. I mean, obviously, she's never going to run a marathon. That's not realistic. But uh, so sometimes the story and the context is also important. Going forward, these things called exosomes, exosomes, microso uh, microsomal vesicles. So how do the stem cells work? So it's unrealistic to think that stem cells kind of morph into like a chondrocyte. I mean, that's just not what happens. So you inject the stem cells. They, I think of stem cells more like general contractors. They come in and they send out messages to, through what we call paracrine effects to the surrounding uh, cellular milieu. Uh, they send messages, kind of like emails. Okay, get to work doing this, you know, through exosomes or microsomal vesicles. Uh, so that's an interesting area going forward. Lots of problems, though, that we have in, the, in our, what I call industry, we have a lot of uh, proprietary knowledge going on. And uh, I won't mention any names, but there's somebody down in the Denver area who says, oh, he's the best in the world, but he doesn't share his information with anybody. He's notorious for kind of holding back, so that's kind of like, well, for the better good, you really ought to tell us how you do things. Why are you the best? Um, the problem of non-responders, I've had patients who I thought would do fantastic, uh, yet really didn't, were disappointing. Why is that happening? I, we don't know. I mean, that's just not, oops, sorry. Third-party reimbursement, uh, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Patients ask me, well, when is insurance going to pay for this? Well, I'll probably be retired. I don't think there's too much there's too much noise, and insurance companies are not paying for anything new in general these days, as a rule. So um, I, I just I'm not holding my breath. Still have regulatory concerns. I mean, it's you know I'm always keeping my eye on, on the news about what the FDA is, FDA is thinking about as far as regenerative medicine, and are we making claims uh, that we um, are able to back up. I can tell you that, and for example, I do a lot of, I do a fair amount of social media marketing myself uh, for reasons that I can get into later, but um, Google would not let me put regenerative medicine or stem cell injections on my own website. They just said that's not happening. So kind of censuring me for even trying. Um, so kind of interesting, the interesting field to be working in. We're using a company called Data Biologics to track all of our outcomes. So ultimately, data kind of wins the day, right? I mean, we got to show that what we do is valuable. And uh, that's, that's kind of 
So this company, they, they're, they're, uh, they're working in this space and uh, have done a great job. Um, so everything that we do is going to be, be tracked uh, for the last, uh, let's say we've been using them at least for the past year, year and a half. So all our data is going to be out there. Uh, so where will your agenda medicine patients come from? Oh, sorry, I got to wrap. Uh, who thinks it's, oh, sorry, misspelled traditional. Who thinks traditional referral medicine network? How many patients are going to come from them? Well, a very low number. So direct to consumer, really, that's what you got to do. I mean, you just, your private practice, family doctor, he doesn't have time. He's got 10 minutes to see a patient. He's not going to get into this discussion. So he's going to write a script and get the patient out the door. Um, so I've been involved in direct to consumer on multiple levels. Uh, I did have my own radio show for about five years, which I must say was had somewhat success. Um, where I just I was like the I was like the Kelsey Grammer or the Dr. Frazier. Patients would call in, and, I, and mostly to talk about interventional pain medicine. Just to, I don't think we've done a great job of getting our message out there of what we can do. I really believe that, and having been in this space for about 30 years. Uh, I get patients all the time that come to me and say, Doctor, I wish I'd known about you 10 years ago. And I'm like, well, you know, your primary care doctor, I've known him for at least 20 years and probably done a dozen lunches in his office during that time. And I don't know what to tell you, but uh, unfortunately, my, my co-host, Doctor, not Doctor, Jerry Berge wore scrubs that day as a joke, uh, passed away this uh, earlier this year with, from esophageal cancer. So I kind of didn't have the heart to continue that show, even though I really enjoyed it. Uh, if you're really interested in this stuff, I'd really recommend that you go to the Toby Conference in Las Vegas, um, the Orthobiologics Institute. Uh, great conference, amazing stuff. These guys are uh, from around the country and, uh, and in fact, around the world. Uh, so if you have an interest in this space, I would definitely look into this. That is the end. Any quick questions? I guess we're running behind, but I'll, I'll, questions from the audience. Yes, sir. into the facet joints. Yes, great question. A lot, we've done a lot of facet, facet joint injections for facet arthritis. Very, overall, very positive results. So, um, and again, the, the arthritis, and I tell patients, look, the arthritis is just an imbalance you have. You know, growing up, you're, you, know, you have turnover of cartilage and all kinds of stuff, and your body's in a dynamic state. All we're doing with arthritis is we're, we're stacking the deck, putting stem cells back in there. So you have stem cells and you have senescent cells, and when you get too many senescent cells and not enough uh, stem cells, you get arthritis. I mean, way oversimplified, but all we're doing is shifting this over in favor of a um, instead of a catabolic situation, an anabolic situation, building up tissue, restoring tissue. So a lot, we've done a lot of facet inje um, stem cell injections in both the low back and the neck with overall remarkable results. Do you inject uh, PRP or is it PR uh, or the um, mesenchymal stem cells? Uh, usually when I'm doing stem cell, I'm injecting PRP in combination with the stem cell. I do a lot of PRP by itself, interdiscal PRP, I think is a really good route to go. Um, uh, but yeah, I've been doing PRP for 20 years. So stem cell uh, became more practical on a clinic, you know, regular clinic basis about 10 years ago where the, the technology became more kind of bench top available in, the, in our, in the average clinic like, like we have. Thank you, Doc. Was that a question or? Yeah. Uh, uh. What stage of your treatment of these patients do you typically open this topic up for them? Like, do you do it in the beginning when you first meet them? Like, we have this option, or do you have you try a little other treatments before you go? Oh, there? absolutely. No, I don't. I'm not a stem cell clinic. I, I'm like, hey, here's this is a tool in the toolbox. If they come in for back pain, I'm going to walk them down the usual things: injections, you know, set injections, RFA's, that kind of thing. But if it if the conversation comes up about stem cell. Um, I'll say, you know, if it's appropriate, we'll, we'll have that discussion. This, and the reason is, a lot of the stuff we do, we're kind of a, 
or kind of painting over the dry rot, right, with, with our pain techniques, RFA included. So this is, in my mind, treating the underlying condition, and I want patients to know that, hey, this is an option. If you want to come back for an RFA every year for your back pain, there is something else that might give you long-term benefit. So, great question.